All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for being here today. So uh, it's uh, 9 a.m. In, in Colorado. I don't know where you guys are, but hope you're having an amazing day as well. Uh, today, I'll be presenting a talk about DevOps, evolution versus revolution. So let's get started. So I'd like to share today by DevOps is a journey, not a destination, and how the evolutionary approach beats a revolutionary approach every time. This talk is aimed at leaders, technical professionals, and anyone interested in understanding and implementing DevOps principles to improve software delivery and organizational agility. Some of the key takeaways I'd like everyone to leave with today are to learn how to avoid some of the pitfalls of a revolutionary approach to DevOps adoption and to discover some strategies for fostering a collaborative culture and empowering teams. So I will be sharing some of my personal experiences which have led me here over my DevOps career and hopefully they can help you navigate uh, DevOps transitions a little better. Uh, before we dive into the concepts of the talk, let me briefly just describe who I am, my background and what I'm about. Uh, I call myself kind of a pre DevOps adopter. I've been practicing DevOps before the, the term was coined in 2009. So right around the, the you know, mid to late 2000s. I'll get into kind of those stories as well. Um, transformation leader. I've led many companies of all sizes through DevOps transformations, and I'll, I'll describe some of those experiences today as well. I'm a published author. I published my first book earlier this year on multi-cloud Kubernetes. You can see some of my social QR codes here and a link to the book if you're interested in checking it out on Amazon or my author's page or, of course, LinkedIn there. I'm also a thought leader, mentor, and coach. I do uh, speaking events. Uh, I mentor and coach several DevOps leaders and professionals as well. So feel free to check out my LinkedIn if you uh, for more opportunities to work together. So a bit about me and my technical background. So I started my career as a sysadmin, DBA, and, and data center kind of rack and stacker in Austin in a very traditional model of software engineering companies. And uh, in 2007, uh, I moved to Silicon Valley to start you know, working at startups that just was always intriguing to me. But this was at the cusp of some of the unimaginable growth of social media and all the different supporting technologies. We had new companies like Airbnb, Dropbox, Instagram, Slack, Uber, WhatsApp, and just an explosion of these companies. And they needed a different way of operating to remain competitive. Finally, in the late 2000s, companies started to figure this out and they started to implement new practices and operating principles to change the game when it came to development, testing and deploying software. That traditional model of um, a software engineering team never talking to an operations team, it just it wasn't working. It wasn't fast enough. It was too slow. So this company started figuring out there are better ways to do it. So my DevOps journey started when I started um, in 2007, making my own Facebook apps where I was handling all the ops and but also writing code. So I was able to get a full picture of the entire software development lifecycle, not as a straight line left to right, but as a complete loop, somewhat of affinity, an infinity loop, you might say. So I was coding like an engineer and I found engineering problems that I'd already been solving during my time as an ops person. So... Um, <clears throat> Here's some of the experiences I've had over the last you know, time here. This is uh, I got the DevOps Rising Star Award in 2019 at DevOps World um, while I was working for Pinger as the uh, DevOps person there. I'll get to some stories at, at, at that uh, company. Uh, I also ran infrastructure at Flexport, so just a larger freight forwarding company. So I have good experience running large scale infrastructure as well. Spoke at DevOps World 2023 last year on one of the panels on AI. Um, Platum is my, and I'll get into some stories about this, was kind of my first experience with truly doing DevOps principles and practices at, at, um, at scale. And currently I'm working as the head of DevOps at Witness AI and responsible for all the, uh, the DevOps practices and principles there. And there's the uh, cover to my book that's just published on March 28th. So I want to talk... Um, a bit about some history, right? And pre DevOps and how it was quite the lawless time. So uh, my first role when I started really honing my DevOps skills was uh, the director of technical operations at Playdom. It was a gaming company in Silicon Valley. You may be recognizing it because it got bought by Disney uh, after a while. So the term DevOps had not been really officially coined yet, uh, but make no mistake, that's exactly what I was doing. Uh, let me paint a picture uh, I was the 18th employee, the only one not doing application engineering, and my entire focus was on how to make engineers more efficient, how to make the code safer and more reliable. So every engineer 
had root access to production. Uh, every deployment was done by an engineer, just SCPing a jar file and restarting Tomcat and just crossing their fingers. It was pretty wild. Uh, monitoring was what you see in front of you here. Literally, I had four monitors stacked up together that had a bunch of terminal windows that were just tailing our Catalina.out files. This was our monitoring solution. Um, we quickly realized that we had to change the way we did things or we simply would not be able to grow. We had problems, right? The ones you would expect. Engineers had root access, constant failures, failed deployments, massive inefficiencies. And you know it was just huge communication gaps. An engineer would yell out, I'm deploying in a room full of 20 other engineers. And it was wild. Uh, everything was manual and not repeatable and therefore broke quite a lot when we were growing exceptionally fast. So we had to make change. We knew what we had to do, but how? So I want to focus here and kind of the rest to talk about how we are going to make these changes, because that's really at the root of it. We can move away from Platum as an example and actually look at this as a ubiquitous issue across all engineering organizations when it comes to making large scale change. How do we move forward? From my experience, um, there's two kind of ways to do it. So one is a revolution, Viva la revolution, right? So um, it tends to be, you know, rapid, sudden, very disruptive. Um, this is, in my experience, not the best approach. Uh, it tends to be, you know, pretty scary. It's often driven by dissatisfaction or some sort of crisis, uh, and it isn't well thought out. Um, we tend to overturn existing systems and replace them with new ones. We, there's a huge potential for uh, radical transformation, which is great, but also it's a huge risk factor and there's instability throughout. Um, the second way that we can look at this is an evolutionary approach. And this is going to be a more gradual approach, right? Incremental over time, small changes, uh, where it's driven by adaptation, learning and improvement, just like evolution in nature. We look at our surroundings and we are constantly adapting and changing the way we're doing our approach in general. We modify and enhance existing systems if we can, because we, you know, they were built for a reason. We didn't generally need to understand why they were built, but we don't have to just straight up replace them. That tends to take a long time. So, uh, you know, if we can just modify and enhance and using, you know, DevOps practices and principles to do so. And this is a gradual process, right? We have some far more stable, uh, far lower risk and tends to really be far more successful. So if we focus on these key differences in the context of DevOps, right? So in a revolution, it's very much usually just someone who doesn't understand uh, just says, everyone needs to do this. And that's typically not the way. You, you don't have buy-in from your stakeholders. You don't have the actual people with hands on keyboards with their support. It's just someone saying, oh, we need to do this and let's do it now. And that just does not work. Uh, they tend to focus on technologies instead of culture of people. And that, again, when you don't involve people and you don't make kind of fundamental cultural changes and you just start upgrading your technology, you're not really making effective change. And this is a very high risk to resistance. People don't like large sweeping change where they were not involved with the decision making process. In fact, they're highly resistant to it. I think anyone who's listening now has worked with engineers and they have ego and they love being right. And if you tell them that the way that they built something is wrong or the way they're doing something is wrong and you need to change it now, you are not going to have a good day. Um, so that's just not not typically a successful way to approach things. With an evolutionary approach, however, you have small incremental manageable changes, manageable changes that you can help build momentum, right? These are low-hanging fruits. You can see change relatively quickly and you can actually start to build on these successes. It starts to get people excited about what it is you're doing. You emphasize on, you know, the collaboration between teams, the communication and that continuous improvement, and they can see it happening, these small incremental changes over time. And it does create a culture of, you know, learning and experimentation and fostering these kind of sustainable change. So avoiding the guillotine. So when I, I worked at a company called Pinger, and uh, this was a non DevOps traditional model, right? And I actually came in to transform into a, a DevOps organization. There was problems um, and I came in, this is a painful story to tell, but I feel it's important because I think, you know, as we learn from our failures and that's, that's just okay. But I came in hot. I came in with this way too much confidence, too much ego. And I was thinking, I'm just going to save this company and I'm going to do it by tomorrow. That was 
uh, not the best approach. And uh, I was the first and only DevOps guy. And I told the existing ops team what I was going to do, what their part was, what I had planned. You know, what I didn't do is ask any of the important questions, like why things were the way they were, why were they built the way they were? And I didn't, you know, plan for gradual small changes that we could adopt based on how they're performing and how successful they were. And probably the most egregious thing I didn't do is ask the existing team for their help, for their buy-in, for their opinion, for their thoughts. And I didn't ask for their contributions other than what I had, you know, decided that they were going to do as participants. And I watched as they just built the world's tallest wall right in front of my eyes. And they just were not on board. The resistance was just top notch. And I realized really quickly this, I had, I had made a mistake and some relationships I was able to recover and some never did, but this was probably one of the best learning opportunities I've ever had in my life. And it's important that you know this because how you approach change matters. It really does. People are, you know, emotional creatures. They have pride. They have all the emotions that and they do carry into work, no matter what anyone says, no one's a robot. Um, and first impressions last. If you come in hot and heavy telling people how, how it is and what you're going to do without asking them questions, they're not going to forget that. And you don't get second chances a lot of the times. You may get some, but not all. And so this actually has real business impacts, right? If you actually create a scenario in which they don't trust you and they put up these walls, you just doubled or tripled your time to market or you've, you've really impacted some of the business uh, metrics that are really important that you were brought in to improve and your success depends on it. It, it really matters how much you're able to win the hearts and minds and establish trust relationships with these people. And, and so it, the revolutionary approach doesn't foster this. You're coming in hot and heavy and you don't have time to build these relationships and you're not going to have a good time. So what I propose is, of course, a gradual growth. Like we, we cultivate, cultivate success in this way with this evolutionary approach. You want to start small, right? Start small, think big. You want to begin with a, like a pilot project or a small team that's open to change and focus on addressing a specific pain point or improving a single process, right? Think small because you have the power to really understand it a lot quicker you have the power to change it a lot more quickly. And again, back to what I said previously, you can see small little wins and they build over time. And you use this pilot as a learning experience and a proof of concept to showcase the benefit of DevOps. Find your champions. This one I'll repeat several times. This is probably one of the most important things I can convey today is find the ones that already have a trust relationship with all of their other peers and coworkers, and they believe in your mission. And you can really foster that relationship. And what ends up happening is they evangelize the mission for you. They have a trust relationship with everyone in the organization because they've been there a while. And their word carries a lot more weight than your word as a new person. And then foster a culture of collaboration, right? This is really important. You want to break down those silos between development operations and other relevant teams. You want to really encourage that open communication, knowledge sharing, and cross-functional collaboration because this builds a lot of trust. Trust is at the key of almost all of this, and it does take time to build. And one of the most important things you can probably do is make sure while you're learning and understanding how things are built and why they were built, you create a blameless environment, right? Where mistakes are seen as opportunities. You say, why was this built? And the worst thing you can say is, well, that was dumb because the person that built it is listening and they're going to hear you and they are never going to listen to you or trust you again because you just called them out and they're going to get responses like, well, it was a good decision at the time or it was the right decision or that was the technology that was available. But what you just did is you built a wall between you guys that's going to take a lot of time to recover from. So create that blameless environment where you just want to understand and you're not blaming anyone for the decisions they made probably eight years ago, right? Next is, you know, some of the real core components of DevOps, right? Prioritize automation. You want to identify repetitive manual tasks that can be automated. Start small, right? Start simple scripts or tools before you move to those auto, like large ones. So you can learn everything you need to learn about the environment on a smaller scale. You can prove out that this actually works and there's benefits. It also frees up a lot of your time to focus on the bigger things. And you can granularly, ex or sorry, gradually expand this automation efforts to cover the entire software development lifecycle, and you just keep getting these wins and the wins keep getting bigger. 
You want to embrace things like infrastructure as code. This is a core concept to DevOps. You want to define infrastructure using code, making it easier to manage, version, and reproduce. Again, freeing up your time, show, freeing up your time, showing the benefits of this. Saying, yeah, oh well, it used to take four days to get a new web server. Now it takes twenty-five minutes. That is one of the biggest wins you can probably have. And people look at you like you're a magician, right? Use tools like Terraform, CloudFormation, or any of these other, you know, Plumi or anything that you know, is out there for automated, or automated provisioning and configuration of these infrastructure resources. Again, this repeatability, this really, this de dependable way of building infra. And you get faster deployments, you reduce your errors. And of course, this promotes consistency across all your environments. All these are huge wins. And just like any good DevOps person knows, implementing CICD is key. Um, I don't have to, I won't spend too much time on this because everyone here knows, but you want to automate the build test and deployment process faster, more frequent releases, use, you know, pipelines to ensure code quality, consistently, consistency and reliability. And of course, this gives much faster feedback loops to your engineers to where they're not fixing bugs from two weeks ago, they're fixing them from two hours ago. And they have, they don't have to do this massive context switch and you get you know just the velocity of your engineer skyrockets and just the quality of your code goes through the roof right and of course you want to be able to monitor measure and learn this is really important not only from a perspective of just you know site reliability or high availability it's also a business key you know this is something that all of the vp levels and c levels will really appreciate because you can establish these kpis that are really important to the business and you can track progress over time and nothing will make you more popular with the CEO than a graph that just shows, you know, this gradual improvement. They love it. They want to see their graph every morning. And this is something that is going to really get, you know, win the hearts and minds of the decision makers showing that the work that you're doing with their engineering teams is actually yielding actionable and visible returns. Right. And this is huge. And you want to use these monitoring tools, you know, to gain the insights in the application performance and health and, and, and everything as well, because these are really important. But tracking business metrics is also huge. And you can collect and analyze this data to make informed decisions about future optimizations, right? If you do a good job of this, this, you know, the, the, the last bit of that infinity loop is feeding right back into the engineering team how their code is performing. You can get it quick and you actually create a lot of automation around it for automated rollbacks or what have you like that. You want to iterate and improve, right? That's just the whole goal of everything. This is an evolution, right? You want regular review processes and building, you know, tools and practices to identify bottlenecks and inefficiencies, right? You want to encourage experimentation and learning from failures. Again, this goes back to the culture, a safe culture where you people can say, I tried it and it failed, but what did we learn? And then you can move forward. And you want to continuously adapt and refine your approach based on the feedback and results. This is the evolutionary approach. Small incremental changes over time result in more stability, good wins. All of a sudden you look back six months and you're just like, wow, I can't believe how far we've come because there was never one huge, massive win. It was just a lot of real small wins put together that over a certain time yield a tremendous impact. You also just want to cultivate, uh, you know, a culture of investing in training and education. Few things in my experience is just managing teams has provided more loyalty than when you invest in your people. When you say, I believe in you. And I think that with the proper amount of resources and, and training, you can be even better and they can take that with them to other jobs, but they're just a better person. If, if they're stagnant or they're doing the same thing every day, they kind of lose excitement about what it is they're doing and why they're there. So you provide training and resources to help teams develop the necessary skills and knowledge to do their work, something they're passionate about, preferably make sure to have that conversation. Don't just tell them that you're going to get your, you know, your Kubernetes cert, you know, or you're going to get your Amazon cert. You're going to ask them what they're interested in, what they're passionate about and where they think they can provide the most value if you invested in them, right? Make it a, a collaborative conversation. And then you create this learning culture where individuals are encouraged to experiment, learn, and share their knowledge with the rest of the teammates. And then everyone's just smarter, better, and you overall, your organization is going to win. So some of these proven strategies I want to get into, and this is... Um, this is something that I think is just from my own experience. And so you can take it and leave it, but this is just over, you know, the 18 years I've been doing this. Um, um, the, this is what I've learned. 
uh, for that same job, I told you where I made that huge mistake at the end, I was able to turn things around because I switched my approach. You know, I, I, I cooled it, cooled my jets. I made sure to move it from a revolutionary kind of approach to an evolutionary approach. And it turned things around uh, even so much that the back end engineering team in that um, created a blog that they uh, send out every two weeks and they called it DevOps man. And it was like, it was a fictional story of the trials and tribulations of DevOps man as a superhero and how we help save the engineering teams. And I'm not kidding. I didn't ask them to do it. They just started writing it because we had such a good working relationship. We also had some really amazing business goals. You know, when I got there, the commit to deploy time was seven weeks. After one year, we had it down to four hours. Can you imagine what the CEO thought about that? We moved most of their operations to the cloud instead of bare metal servers. So we're able to move everything as infrastructure as code. So just the iterative abilities of that operations team were 100x, right? Um, this couldn't have been done with the revolutionary approach. There's too much and it's, it's just this overnight recklessness mentality that you can just save the day quickly. It just does not work. It had to be done slowly using this evolutionary approach that I spoke about. So here's some of the main proven strategies in my experience I wanted to share. Emphasize and support your champions. I've talked about this. Find the ones that have that believe in what you're doing. And usually they're like, thank God you're here. I've been wanting to do this for so long, right? They have good established trust relationships with their coworkers. And those are going to be the biggest drivers you can possibly imagine. Foster those relationships, support them, make sure you are always, you know, their biggest fan and vice versa. You're going to want to go ahead and make sure you're paying attention, build tools, build platforms. Everyone's talking about platform engineering. Well, this has always been around. It's been a part of DevOps since the beginning, but building tools and platforms to enable engineers makes their lives so much better. DevOps doesn't want to be a blocker. You want to be an enabler. That means a lot of time removing yourself. None of this put in a ticket and I'll build in for, from you, for, you know, for you. Uh, it's, hey, I built this tool. And now if you need something, you can go ahead and build it yourself. And that, but that, that makes people so happy because, you know, no one likes having to wait on someone else or no one likes having to say, I know you're busy, but right. And so uh, build the tools that they need. Also, I would say this is just from personal experience and this uh, under promise over deliver, right? If you think you can do it in three months, say four and deliver it in three and a half, that is from a business side, it's perfect. And setting expectations early, uh, that is just going to save you an immense amount of time. Uh, and I would say this is just in the beginning for sure, but just as a good operating principle is just ask so many questions more than you thought. Uh, once you think you've asked enough, ask more, even if they're ridiculous, it's a, it's such a neat strategy because it does a few things. One is it, it does answer those questions Two, It makes people know that you are curious, that you're not just coming in there. Like, you know, everything that you are actually curious about how it was built, why it was built, what decisions came into it, what were the requirements at the time? You know, what were the technologies at the time? Who was here? Who wasn't here? These are really important questions that you get the, that you need to be able to ask so you can actually understand at a fundamental level the problem is you're trying to solve in the exact solution that you're trying to potentially replace or improve. And again, people will see that you are curious and they will appreciate the time spent. No one's going to say, I don't have time for your questions, especially if you're going to be rebuilding something they built. So this is actually a really solid strategy. And once you've asked all these questions, listen, I cannot emphasize this anymore. Just shut your mouth and listen, because a lot of times they have a lot more to say than just answering that question. And if you really sit there and let them speak, and even just after they speak, you know, some moments of silence and just let them keep speaking. You're going to learn a whole lot more about the solution that they created and about them as a person. And people appreciate being listened to. And this is a psychological thing. And it's just simply true. They'll build more trust. They'll like talking to you. You're not just sitting there and be like, what'd you do here? And then talk over them and just move on. Like you assume you already know the answer. They're just not going to talk to you anymore. So spend more time than you would actually think asking questions and listening to what it is they have to say. You will be rewarded in spades for sure. And find ways to build trust. Like when I go into organizations, I find a lot of the key players, I take them to lunch. You can expense it, but take them to lunch, learn about it, learn the struggles, learn their wins, learn what they're proud of, their passions, right? And keep track of it. Don't just take them once, take them once a month or, you know, however much you think is appropriate, but make sure you foster these relationships because that builds trust and trust is key on everything you want to do here. 
and it does take time. But if you, you know, you're remembering things about them, even take notes, totally fine. I think they'd even appreciate that, but you keep it clear in your head and you want to make sure that you're talking about the solutions as you're building them, right? And you keep them involved and you make them feel like they're part of the solution. That is probably one of the biggest things you can do in terms of making sure that they trust you and that you have a good relationship. So I think we're at time. So I'd love to hear any questions from anybody. Let me go to the Q&A. So how would you counter any objections to an evolutionary approach? It's going to take too long. Perfect. So the answer there is, you know, if it, if we don't, if, if you don't take the necessary time to include all these steps, the problem is you're going to either have a subpar solution or no solution at all. There's the actual possibility that engineers will just put their hands up and say, we're not doing this. And that's a bigger risk to me. I would rather tell someone saying, Hey, you said this is going to take nine months. Why? Like we don't have nine months of this and say, well, you know, if we want to cram it into three, what you're going to have is half your team is going to get burned out. You're not going to get the optimal solution because you didn't take the time to adequately research and prepare. And you're going to have the same problems uh, that you have now, but just a different set of technology underneath it. So convincing them that, you know, the ultimate goal is solving the problems, not just creating new problems has always worked well for me. So um, let's see here. So uh, Sarsani, how important is to know everything or do you prefer a th few things, but efficiently? That's a good question. Um, it depends on where you are. There's a the whole jack of all trades, master of none. I think if you, I've always been, had the benefit of coming in early and getting a good idea of the technologies. But also when you start to build a team, you can start to assign specialists. If you're on your own, then you're not going to understand everything all, all the time. But what you can do is focus on the most important, painful things at the moment, get a deeper understanding of it. So you can then say, yes, I do fully understand the problem. These are the solutions. You get all the feedback from the stakeholders. You guys decide on a solution. You fix that solution for in a long-term way. And you move on to the next. You can't actually have a deep understanding of every bit of the system all at once. So you have to decide what's the highest priority. And that's why I usually recommend that low hanging fruit in the small scope. So you can start to understand small bits of the business. You can improve them in a permanent way to once they're there, they're automated and it's a solved problem. And you move on to the next one, which leads to maybe potentially solving bigger and bigger problems. But you already have that foundation of understanding those smaller problems that you've already solved. So this approach does allow you to start to build a foundation of knowledge of the business and all the operating principles and all the technology in the stack slowly. And so you start to build it over time. And then at, once you get to a point, you're starting to solve really big problems because you have that foundational knowledge. So uh, Sarsani also said, could, uh, couldn't could imagine pre-DevOps how difficult it would have been to collaborate. That's a good question. And the answer, <laughs> believe it or not, was you just didn't. And I hate to put it that way, but you didn't. There, When I say it was a wall, I mean, they literally, there was an email with the location of a jar file and they said, here's the deployment, you know, here's the database migration steps and copy and paste. And I would literally at 10 at night, go copy and paste. If anything went wrong, I'd roll back, send back the email said deployment failed. And that was the end of it. And it was, it wasn't great because it was blame game. It was, you know, this is an operations problem. No, it's an engineering problem. And there was a lot of that, a lot of hard conversations. And so, um, it was not a great place and, there were some heated arguments and, you know, at the end of the day, you had to get VPs involved to actually settle this. And like, it was just slow and you just didn't like your job and you didn't like dealing with them. You'd see them walk by and you'd be like those engineers and they'd see you walk by and like those ops guys, it was, it was lawless and it wasn't, it wasn't good. And so I'm really glad that DevOps came and that's why I latched onto it as, as quickly as I could. So I think we have less than one minute left and, um, and no more any questions. Uh, if anyone else, um, wants to ask anything, I'll be here for the next 54 seconds. If not, um, I really appreciate everyone coming out. And I know it's kind of the end of the day for a lot of people. So appreciate your time. And uh, if you ever need anything, kind of you can go back uh, and, and into the slides and look at um, some of the QR codes to visit my, my LinkedIn or, or my author page on Amazon and uh, check out the book, Multi-Cloud Kubernetes which is also from my experience at, uh, at Flexport where me and my team actually built multi-cloud Kubernetes and it was an extremely painful process 
that, uh, you know, I had a team of nine people reporting to me and it took around 18 months and uh, it was painful. So what I decided was I was going to take that experience, write it in a book and make sure and, and try to help other people and maybe not make it so painful. So check it out if you get a chance. But other than that, thanks everyone so much. I really appreciate your time. Take care.